Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever in the world you're joining us from. Welcome to the sixth Oxford University Press History Book Club meeting. My name is Susan Ferber, and I'm one of the history editors at OUP. On behalf of my colleagues, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. For those of you who were at previous book club meetings featuring Thomas Holt's The Movement, Kevin Weddle's The Complete Victory, Annalise Hines's Mahjong, Phoebe Young's Camping Grounds, or Gordon Campbell's Norse America, welcome back. If you didn't get to see these live, you can watch the recordings on OUP's YouTube channel. For those of you who are joining us for the first time today, here's a little background. Reading and talking about books in a group has a long tradition. In the late 18th and early 19th century, the first American reading circles or conversations, a precursor to history book clubs, were begun. They required little more than a thirst for knowledge and a desire to discuss it with like-minded individuals, to talk about challenging ideas, to learn together, and hopefully to have a little fun along the way. That's the spirit in which this book club was founded. What we lack in the intimacy of a small group, I hope we can gain in creating a broad community of readers. This book club will give you the chance to directly interact with authors, as well as an opportunity to continue the conversation online with others in the book club. Every meeting features two OUP authors in conversation, in this case, a writer of a new book with one of our backlist titles. Over time, we aim to share histories from across the globe, from a variety of periods of history and many different authorial perspectives. As an editor, I tend not to think about events in the 21st century as history. It's difficult to get archival sources, and more importantly, historical distance from events in order to write deep contextualized history. Today's work is a true exception, already hailed as the landmark history of the American war in Afghanistan and a broad reaching and quietly authoritative overview of US involvement from 9-11 onward. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our author and books today. This is the most bare bones description of these historians since we could easily take just a half hour to talk about their accomplishments. Carter Malkazian served as Special Assistant for Strategy to the Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman, G General Joseph Dunford from 2015 to 2019 and was deployed multiple times in Afghanistan, including time spent as a State Department political officer and district stabilization team leader in Helmand province. He is the author of War Comes to Garmsar, 30 Years of Conflict on the Afghan Frontier, as well as Illusions of Victory, the Anbar Awakening, and the Rise of the Islamic State. Importantly for this venue, he holds a doctorate in history and wrote the work that is the topic of today's book club, The American War in Afghanistan, through the lens of a trained historian, as well as someone with on-the-ground experience and fluency in Pashto. He is joined in conversation by Jeffrey Engel, founding director of the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University. He is the author and editor of numerous books, including works on U.S. military involvement in the Middle East, such as The Last Card, Inside George W. Bush's Decision to Surge in Iraq. Carter and Jeff are going to speak for about 30 to 35 minutes, and then the floor will be open to all of your questions. You can start putting them in the chat anytime, and my colleague Erin Cox will bring up as many as she can in the second part of the program. You can also go to at OUP History Twitter feed and comment using the hashtag OUP History Book Club. So welcome, Carter and Jeff. Thank you for being here, and the floor is now yours. Susan, thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you for this uh, venue, and thank you to everybody for tuning in for this conversation, which I am really, really personally looking forward to. Um, you know, as I was joking with Carter beforehand, and I'm sure I'm not the first person to make this joke, uh, not only is it a brilliant work of scholarship, but talk about timely. Uh, I mean, it, this is something that everyone is asking. And so I know that you all watching have a ton of questions. So please put them in the chat box and we will get to as many as possible. But uh, if you don't mind, Carter, I'd like to begin kind of with an inside baseball historians question, uh, which is when I first received this this book in the mail and it's it's a it's a hefty tome. Uh, I said to myself, boy, that's ambitious because for the same reason that Susan mentioned, it's hard to figure out when to start telling a story and it's also hard to figure out when to end a story and i'm curious first and foremost when did you finally put this book to bed <laughs> what is the time frame of how far back do, are we reading in a sense you know, of, of a story that's in some ways still unfolding on oh, this is a good question and 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 Jeff, thank you for the introduction and, and susan thank you for 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 the words the kind words that you said as well on um, 
so I mean, writing the book, I first decided I wanted to write a big book on the whole Afghan war in 2013. Um, or I, 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 that was when the idea first kind of started growing that, that I should do that. And I had already written one book on Afghanistan, but I felt like um, to grow as a historian, I had to move beyond talking about the detailed, like I did in War Comes to Armistice, and talk more about the broad, talk more about something that had happened that was big over a long period of time. Um, and so I, I, I wanted to attempt to do that. And, and like you, I've read many books that, that have done that. So I, I felt it was important to do. Um, and then, so this is 2013, right? So the war had already been going for 13 years. I knew it would take a few years for me to finish writing it. I wasn't really sure what the end point was. There was the possibility the war might wind up, um, but it was also the possibility to continue. But I thought, well, there is no good history of at least the first 10 years of the war. There's nothing about that. So why can't I start writing? I knew about the histories of the Vietnam War. And I knew that many of those first histories of the Vietnam War started being written in the in the late 70s, um, about 10 years or a little bit more than 10 years of, of U.S. involvement, since most of the, the Vietnam histories of that time kind of really focused on 65 or so as the, as the beginning of a lot of focus there. So I thought, OK, I have some perspective and I'll have more perspective as time goes on. Then ending it, yeah, that, that, that took something because um, it wasn't clear what the break point could be to end it. Um, so I, and I, I ended up back in government uh, doing more work there in which I got kind of a broader viewpoint of the conflict. But at one time I thought, well, the end of the Obama administration, that's a natural break point. Um, and then after that, I kind of thought, well, maybe sometime in the Trump administration. And then I, and when I, in my, I, I wrote the book and I submitted the final version of the book with the February 2020 agreement between the United States and the Taliban being the end point. Then in April of 2021, after I had submitted the final, all, all the final stuff, um, President uh, Biden announced we were going to leave. Um, and so when that happened, I immediately um, emailed the editor and said, please send me the book back. Please send me, <laughs> let me, let me make some last edits. And OUP kindly allowed me to do that, but they were also very specific. They said, well, you can do that, but there can't be any changes in pagination. All the pages have to stay the same. So what that meant was that I lifted off whole paragraphs out and I put whole new paragraphs in, carefully checking, like that by line. I had exactly exactly right. <laughs> number. Um, and then switched all that out, put all new stuff in. And, and that's where it, um, I don't know, that, that's how it ended up ending. And even now, right, the book's not ending. It, it, it's, it, I mean, the, not that the book has ended, the story hasn't ended. Um, I ended the book with President Biden's announcement that didn't see everything that's happened over the past few months. Um, so it doesn't have that. And any historian is certainly justified in criticizing that I finished the book at a point which I really don't have good perspective on at least the past five years. Um, and, and, and I know that's going to be a criticism of it. And I don't really know oh, what to do about it. That's a criticism I would shove off, to be honest, because it's such an impressive work, especially, as you said, if you really want to tell the story of the, the first years, uh, that's that's the place to start. In fact, let's start the discussion there, if, if you don't mind. Uh, you know, and again, this is a question, I guess, generated by the events of the last few weeks and months. I find myself wondering more and more, why were we there? Uh, and I, I suspect there is a superficial answer. I mean, one could just say 9-11 and walk away. Uh, but I think there's a deeper answer to why we were there for 20 years. And I'm curious what your perspective is on why we were there and why the how the why changed over time so 9 11 is is obviously a big part of it um and it's the and it's the fear of terrorism and it's that 9 11 made that fear palpable made that fear real i mean you probably remember as well as i do that like the 1990s terrorist attacks big attacks on the united states you know that's like a diehard movie on that and and it was something to think about and talk about a little bit but it wasn't treated seriously as a policy issue um but 9 11 made this threat of an attack very real for people and not just airplanes crashing into buildings of well if the terrorists were going to do this why wouldn't they use chemical weapons why wouldn't they use biological weapons why wouldn't they use nuclear weapons if they can get a hold of it um and so that that pushes us into Afghanistan, and that also makes it hard to leave, and it makes it hard to leave for many years. On um, on top of that, you have to pair that against the domestic political side of it. That it, it's it, the threat is part of it, but it's also the sense amongst presidents that if they don't do something, if they don't 
act and an attack occurs in the United States, it'll be tremendously damaging to them. So Bush is you know, viscerally concerned about this um, in 2001, uh, before the attack occurs and even after that, that if he doesn't act, if he doesn't do something soon, something else will be coming down the rails and there will be no forgiveness um, for what happens next. So he must do something. Um, that fear definitely continues in 2002, 2003 for, for eight years or so, and it even lasts you know, into the Obama administration. But the, that, that, so that's, that's kind of like one reason we stay. Another reason that we stay is perhaps less official. Um, so we talk a lot about nation building and all the concerns that, that, that lay in there. Really, in most of the official documents and statements, nation building doesn't feature very high. Democracy and elections, they feature somewhat in there, but there isn't a huge, there's so much of it, not a huge amount of material about, oh, we want to improve education, we want to improve women's rights, uh, and we want to make things better for the average Afghan. That, though, was there. Just because it isn't there in the official documents doesn't mean that it's not an undercurrent that's going on. After all, many of these efforts started not so much as official actions of U.S. policy, but started happening because NGOs were doing things or elections just kind of naturally get written into how we're seeing the, the country develop. So you can't deny that there's this idealistic aspect of it that's pushing us forward and that's pushing us to stay there for longer. Um, and now as the war keeps going and as it becomes apparent that the Taliban are back and a fight is occurring, um, some of the goals start to change more. So that instead of talking about that we're going to defeat uh, the Taliban, we start to talk about, well, we're going to enable the Afghan government to stand on its own so that we can leave. And that's really the policy the Obama administration adopted. But you'll note that until very late, they're still not willing to leave Afghanistan. They're still not willing to withdraw. They're still concerned about terrorism, but they are willing to say, how, how can we turn this over um, to, the, to, to, to the Afghan forces? Um, and as the war keeps going, I think a criticism that's occurred more lately is, well, the military what they've done is is they didn't want to lose um and so they were resistant to departing or insistent on re on reinforcing that is there's some truth to that and there's some exaggeration in that too um but i think it is it is th there is a, a grain of truth there that the idea of departing the idea of the taliban winning the idea of seeing what we've just seen did deter departure and keep us there for a longer amount of time. Um, so I guess if I, I've been talking a little bit too long on this, but if I want to, if I want to make it, um, if I want to summarize it a little bit, I'd say that from 01 until sometime in the in the teens, the United States was very concerned about terrorism, terrorism from Al Qaeda, terrorism from the Islamic State, and there was a domestic political danger that accompanied that. That era, that epic had great influence on keeping us in Afghanistan. But that era also eventually came to an end. Um, and eventually terrorism becomes less of a worry. The Islamic State is defeated. Um, we're worried about China and Russia. We're worried about domestic problems. We're worried about the economy more. We're worried about the pandemic. The, and so, I mean, as a historian, I look at this as kind of like a structural change in the international system. So that the context that was existing at one time starts to go away. And as that context shifts, it now becomes more possible, easier, a wider opportunity to leave Afghanistan. And I think that's what we've kind of seen play out. So, you know, it's striking, of course, that the many of the soldiers who are there now were perhaps not yet born uh on 9-11 and obviously that's consumed their entire lives but that's also true not just for our side of course but for people within afghanistan um and i was hoping you could talk a little bit to us about two interrelated questions i think you know, the the first is who are the taliban in the sense of are they the same have they been the same over time have they changed how have they evolved and, and also their relationship to al-qaeda and other terrorist organizations how that's evolved and to a second point, and this is something wonderful from your book that you point out so eloquently, um, who are the people who made up the Afghan defense forces and what was going through their minds? All right. So maybe I'll tell you a little bit. If, if it's OK, I'll tell you a little bit about the Taliban by telling you the story of one Taliban. Um, 
So I'll tell you about Mullah Naim Barich. Uh, Mullah Naim Barich did not fight in the 80s uh, against the Soviets. Um, he was too young um, to have done that. At that time, he was a refugee in Pakistan. He was going to a madrasa religious school. He was getting connected to some of the other leaders through that religious school who would later become the, the leaders of the Taliban um, itself. He was uh, from Garmster District, where I wrote the, uh, my, one of my previous books, um, and he was from a poor part of the district. His family hadn't necessarily been treated well by the elites. The elites didn't really respect their land, and there were all kinds of land disputes uh, that, were go that were going on there. Um, so that puts uh, Naeem in a kind of difficult position. But when the Taliban rise up in 1994 in Kandahar, and they rise up to fight the anarchy of various warlords that are there, um, he joins them. So some of the Taliban leaders at that time would have included uh, Mohammed Hassan, who is now the prime minister uh, or, or director of, of the new interim government, would have included Mullah Baradar, who we've now seen on TV a great amount. But Naeem joins them. Um, and because Naeem's active and he has enough connections, he's able to rise up a little bit to have kind of a middle leveling position. He's able to go back to his district of Garmsir and he tries to... Um, he makes sure the Taliban have asserted control. Uh, there's court systems that are put in place to conduct rule of law. Various warlords and such are disarmed. Um, and he makes sure that the poor folk within the, um, within the district, that they have better access to land and they're permitted to grow poppy uh, because poppy is a good livelihood for a poor farmer. It makes money easily, uh, raises their standard of living. Um, so Mullah Naeem does that um, for a series of, of years until we come. And we topple um, the, the, that Taliban government. Mullah Naeem, as far as I know, didn't have any relations with Al-Qaeda or anything like that um, at that time. Um, so we topple them. And so Mullah Naeem goes back to Pakistan. And he starts helping the Taliban organize, helping getting them ready to go back, to recover, to get back into Afghanistan. So in 2006, when the Taliban are ready to do that, he is one of the main leaders going up into Helmand, into that single province, leading the Taliban forces. Um, and he's able to capitalize on the grievances that the government has created inside of the district by, again, treating people poorly who don't have a lot of land, eradicating the poppy of their opponents, and various abusive policemen. So he exploits that, um, but he's able to go back into, in, in, into Garmsir and reassert um, the, the, the Taliban control there. Um, during his time there, He's not really known as a merciful person, but he's not known as incredibly abusive either. I mean, he, he will execute um, people who are aligned with the government. But on the other hand, he's not very interested in the other Taliban who are extremely brutal. So one of their, one of their leaders who is brutal, um, Naeem, has exile. Um, he raises up in position to become the provincial governor of, of the province. Um, and he's eventually wounded in an airstrike on another Taliban leader, Mullah Dadullah Lang, who was quite an aggressive and some would say vicious um, commander. Mullah Naeem survives that. Um, eventually is working in, in Helmand again, um, doing various smuggling things and, and, and organizing people. His relationship with Al-Qaeda um, through all that remains murky and, and, remains, and remains unclear. So, and Naeem now actually don't know where he is right now. I'm not, I'm not sure where he's, uh, he didn't, he's not in the government as far as any of the names that I saw, but maybe he'll be a governor again, maybe he'll be something else, I'm, I'm not sure. But he's a good kind of story of, of a Taliban commander through all of this. Um, now other Taliban have a much murky relation, even murky relation, but actually have a relationship um, with, the, with the Taliban, so with Al Qaeda, I'm sorry. So one, one former Taliban who I worked with for a bit in, uh, in Kabul when I, when I was there, we worked for a long time together and, he, uh, and it was time for me to go home and we had worked on kind of getting peace initiatives started, nothing at the very high level, just kind of low level stuff. Um, and when I was, so I was leaving, went back to the United States and he says, Carter, I hope that you, uh, hope you have a good time in the United States. Hope you see your family. I hope that, and I hope we get, were able to stay in contact. I hope I see you again. Um, and then he says, why would you think I'd feel any differently about Al Qaeda? They were our friends too. Um, and so I think that kind of statement, like, I don't think the person I was working with wanted to attack the United States. 
but he was ready to admit that there was a relationship here between the two organizations. And I think that sort of kind of encapsulates um, what's what's seen there. Um, let, let, can I interject at, at this point for, for this part? What's notable about the way you tell the story there of that individual and also of your experience there, I don't believe, unless I'm mistaken, that I heard the word religion or any sub variation of the word religion at all in that story. And, and, you know, this obviously harkens back to earlier questions, say about the Vietnam war, you know, were the Vietnamese insurgents and North Vietnamese driven by ideology or were they driven simply by a sense of nationalism and economic desire and development? The, uh, the Taliban, uh, we usually hear them as, as described as religious hardliners, but that wasn't part of your, your tale. Uh, no, I'm not going to say that you had to give the exclusive, the, the, the full tale there, but it, it is notable. So on, um, I think the Taliban are highly motivated by resisting occupation mm -hmm. um, and to what they believe their duty to be under Islam. Now, whether that's correct or not is a different question. I'm not trying to say Islam inspires violence or something like that. Um, but in most Taliban statements, when you say why they are fighting, Islam comes up quite clearly. For the Mullah Naim himself, when people asked him, um, why don't you work with the government? He'd say, I was Taliban, I am Taliban, I will be Taliban. When the American forces came in, he was um, shooting from the top, top of rooftops um, at US helicopters um, that, that were flying by. Um, and so I think there, there is an, an, there's an element there, but moreover, if I ask someone, uh, some of the higher level who I may have spoken with during the negotiations in Doha, you know, when did the Taliban decide to fight the United States? Um, they say, well, when there was a fatwa issued for jihad in October 2001 against an American invasion. Um, so, I mean, I, I do think that runs pretty deep um, with the Taliban, but it's also something that is going to be mixed in with the other factors, which you can see kind of clearly from Naeem's story. Okay, now let's, let's jump back to the, the earlier question then, uh, if you don't mind, I, I interrupted you. Oh, no, 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 no problem. So if I want to turn to a uh, to an Afghan, um, I think I'll, 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 I'll turn to um, Omar John, who's also in War Comes to Garmson, but then is also in uh, the, the newest book, The American War in Afghanistan. So he, um, he wasn't from a rich family in, in Helmand. He was from a, a more middling family. His mother and father died when he was fairly young. It was up to him and his brothers to take care of the family. They had a small amount of land in the district of Marja. Um, and so he used to become a policeman. That's not actually the, a job um, that any elite wants. So it's very fitting for his middling rank um, that he goes to, to become a policeman um, while his older brother is kind of mending the land and the other brothers are doing um, various things. He is someone who doesn't care for the warlords and elites um, in Afghan society. He is someone who leans much closer to Ghani and, and uh, President Ashraf Ghani, President of Afghanistan, and his beliefs about reform, progress, improving Afghanistan. Um, and Omar John drew close to American forces during his time as policeman, um, and he certainly came to, to trust Americans, and, and we certainly came to trust him. Um, he was not, unlike a lot of the rest of the Afghan military, he wasn't overly corrupt. I guess I overly corrupt because I, everyone's corrupt to some extent. And I guess we could talk more about that. Um, but I'm not going to try to whitewash who he was or, or, or what he was. Um, but the thing he was, did that's different from many of the other commanders is he took care of his men. He made sure they had weapons. He made sure that they were clothed well, made sure they were paid and had their salaries. Um, was always incredibly concerned, especially with me, about whether his men were seeing their pay, if they were seeing it on time, um, because he just understood that if you didn't take care of your men, that things were going to go things were going to go poorly for you. Um, so he spent a lot of time doing that. Now, eventually, the United States leaves on um, um, leaves Helmand, leaves most of Afghanistan, and that's really the situation. Most of Afghanistan since 2014 has been that there aren't really U.S. forces in the provinces. U.S. forces are in some specific locations at some cities. Um, and doing some operations in some areas, but they're absent from a lot of places. So Omar Jones operating on his own with his, with his police forces. Um, and in 2015, the Taliban start attacking again in large numbers. And Omar Jones fights. He tries to defend his front line the best he can, tries to take care of his men the best he can. Sometimes he never lets his men run. 
they're not quite as inspired as the Taliban are. They're not as um, they're not as determined to fight for their country as the Taliban are to to fight for their cause, which mm -hmm. goes back to kind of the the, the earlier point that you made. Um, but Omar John keeps on fighting. Um, the fighting was really harsh for about uh, uh, two years for him. About in the middle of that, this is in 2016, he calls me and he says, uh, you know, Carter, is, um, things are, aren't going well. The Taliban are doing this, the Taliban are doing that. We're fighting, we're, we're holding the front line, but I just need a little bit of help. You know, if you could just have just one American or a few Americans come down here, I don't want them to stay. I just want to go over with them some procedures for coordinating airstrikes so I can get some airstrikes when I need those airstrikes. Um, but I don't want them to stay. He talks a little bit more, and he says, you know, but, but Carter, listen to me. If no one else is fighting, if everyone else is going to go away, and it's just going to keep on being like this, eventually, I'm going to have to run too. I can't do this forever. And you know, what he meant by that was if the government isn't, um, isn't helping him enough, isn't assisting him enough, then he can't sacrifice himself and his tribe for the government. That's antithetical. The tribe takes care of the family. The tribe takes care of itself. The tribe doesn't die for the government. If the government helps the tribe, the tribe will help it back. That's, that's the way things are. And so he's explaining this. And, and, and so I listen um, and try to give him whatever words of encouragement I can. In 20, later on that year, the Taliban attacked the provincial um, capital of Lashkargah, on um, they don't take all of, of where he is, but they take a lot of it. And during that fighting in Lashkar, I mentioned his old elder brother earlier. His older brother is killed by a suicide bomber in that fight. On um, by, uh, by 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 a separate Taliban commander. Omar John is heartbroken at the loss of his brother, uh, and he's not sure if he should keep on fighting. He's worried about the family. Worried if she should keep going. And for a moment, he says he's going to retire. Another Afghan, a district governor, calls him and says, "You can't retire." If you retire, everyone will lose faith. Everyone will lose hope. You have to keep fighting. So he goes back to the front lines and carries it on. Then in, in early 2017, something happens that raises his spirits. 300 Marines return to Helmand um, to, to operate with the Army and, and with the police to give them support, not in the front lines fighting, but to give them support from, from behind. And that and some of these Marines are people he's worked with before. He know that he whom he knows personally. With them there with him, he's back fighting. Um, he's on. He's he 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 is getting shot at. Um, the Marines can see him from their drones, where he'll be in a firefight. He'll be shots will be coming in as he takes cover behind his pickup truck. He'll know the drone is up there, so he'll wave at the drone and then point at the direction the, that they should fire. I mean, at the same time, actually relaying what the coordinates should be over, over the proper devices. So he does this for a little while. In late 17, uh, he, he's driving back to his headquarters um, on a Saturday after the holiday of Friday. Um, and Taliban ambush him. An RPG sails through his windshield and kills him. Um, so... I'm not really sure why Omar John kept fighting as long as he did. I don't know if it's because of honor. I don't know if it's because he believed in the cause. I don't know if it's because he was inspired by us or he felt he was doing something in that regard. In any case, you know, he sacrificed most of his family for it. His older brother wasn't the only one to die. Two other brothers died. The rest of the family was left under the uh, supervision of one brother on, and with not much more left of them whatsoever. And in fact, when the Taliban took over Lashkargah, the rest of the family just kind of said, fine, we're going to go live at home, leave us alone. Mm -hmm. um, but I, mean, I tell the Omar John story because I think it gives you a better idea of why some Afghans fought, what put them under pressure, and why in the end that they, uh, well, I guess also that what we saw happen in the last month doesn't tell the whole story. Doesn't tell the whole story of all the Afghans of what they've done. It may also tell you a little bit about why things turned out the way they did. Well, and, and to that point, could you help us understand more why the Afghan government from 2001, whatever government you want to say, whichever prime minister and so on, why they were not able to create the same loyalty and enthusiasm as the Taliban? I mean, the, the story you tell is. Um, it's, a, it's a, an hourglass in which the sand is constantly running out and not being refilled. 
Um, why couldn't they get more sand? On um, so for, one for thing. Uh, so one of the, the one of the problems with inspiration is um, the, the the management problems and the difficulties that the government had the corruption in the government. So the corruption affected not only on um, the amount of weapons that may have been at a post or the number of men that were at a post, but it also affected the willingness of those men to go fight for the country. If they feel like all their commanders are pocketing uh, money, if they feel like their commanders aren't going to take care of them, then how much longer are they going to fight for? Um, and so that, that is one cause. And Sami Sadat, who is a commander in Afghanistan, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times where he actually mentioned this, um, in addition to some other factors. So, I mean, that is there, but it doesn't fully explain everything we've happened because it doesn't explain, well, why did Omar John's men not fight um, a little bit better? Why do the commandos with the Afghan forces, why do they not? They're well-trained. They're known to have better tactics, better equipment, better personnel, everything than the Taliban. Why, when, when we left, did they all fold? And even before that, they had trouble fighting well without us. Um, why, why do we think that, you know, and it, why is it the Taliban who forces aren't supplied well, who get awful medical care, um, whose commanders are hiding in Pakistan to a great extent, why are they willing um, to fight so hard? And that's where you, you start to come down to, well, the Taliban have something to fight for. They have you know, resistance to occupation and, they, they, and, and their, their leaders are mullahs and they're people who can, who can, legit, who can say at least in the, um, to the eyes of the rest of the villagers, they can say it's legitimate for Islam to conduct this fight. The government has trouble doing that. First and foremost, because the government is aligned with us mm -hmm. on and so, and they have trouble inspiring to the to this to, to the same extent. On um, soldiers in the field will have questions about, well, what are we really fighting for? Is this government just? Is it not just? Um, and there's polls that talk about how few of the the, the members of the government really are um, interested in, in in fighting, and how they have questions about, is the government a legitimate government? Is it an illegitimate government? Um, is, is, is it right to fight against the government that's on Islamic? Many polls of Afghan soldiers and the Afghan people say, yes, it is right to fight against the government that is on Islamic. Mm -hmm. um, so these kind of problems really dig in. And, and I guess I'll tell you one story on that. Um, in 2014, I was having um, dinner outside with two, two Afghans, a tribal leader and a government official who I've known for, for some time. And we were eating, and they were saying, "Hey, we're sorry that we're over here, kind of eating here alone. And sorry, it's not a big, it's not a big group." And I said, "Well, don't worry about it. I understand. If there's other Afghans here, then they may think that you are close to me, and that may cause you problems. I understand that." And so Carter doesn't matter. They rolled up their sleeves and they said, "We are already painted, Muzrang Shuyu. We are already painted with having worked with the Americans." In other words, it won't be forgiven. It will be remembered that that we did this. Um, so it's a it's deeply embedded in in the identity that's there, and it and so even if you were to be able to say that well, they, we're going to give the Afghan government you know perfect leadership and no corruption and no problems, there's still this serious question. E even with that, and you should be thinking, are all those things even possible in the first place? But even with that would they have the same inspiration that the Taliban do? The Taliban send people to kill themselves in cities, to blow themselves up in cities which were the place where the government had the most control. There is nothing like that that the government forces have done. And it's hard to construct a counterfactual in which one could see that occurring. So uh, let me go back, if, if I could, to the... You know, the place that we began of, of the tension, creative tension uh, between yourself as a policymaker, as a policy analyst, as a contributor to uh, American policy and to peace uh, efforts, and also as a historian. Um, I mean, I'm listening to your tale and I'm saying to myself, I could have changed the names and the story would have been the same if we were talking about Vietnam or Algeria or any number of places where, you know, a, a, an occupying power proved incapable of generating the loyalty of people who cared first and foremost about getting rid of the occupying power. Um, is there anything that we could have done or that the Afghan government could have done? As you think about this as a historian, uh, and more importantly, I guess what I really want to know is 
did you did you question this as a historian while you were doing policy making work? Um, I'd have to, I mean, my understanding of Afghanistan, if I can call that understanding, has only evolved or changed, hopefully improved over time. Um, and earlier on, no, I thought that we could enable the Afghan government to, well, I, I thought that as a historian, I thought that it's possible for this government to stand as long as we have some number of small forces there for a, for a fairly long time. But I didn't put the same kind of emphasis on the, the, the resistance to occupation aspects that's come over time. And I was much more, I thought that more change was possible. I thought we could have done more things to make a difference than I now think is possible now. Um, that changed partly because as I got to higher levels of government, I realized that some of the things I had recommended in the past just wouldn't be done because it just wasn't time in the day for our senior decision makers to make them happen. They demanded too much political capital. Like land reform is the perfect one. Land reform is the cause of a great, the lack of land reform is the cause of a great number of problems in Afghanistan and is definitely generating violence. The Taliban are going to have a headache with this. Um, but so the standard kind of ideas I'd, you'd come up with to deal with that, you know, I'd put forward and in 2011, 2012, I thought that, well, these are still fairly possible. You might be able to tackle them. And that's not higher levels of government. I realized, well, this just is not possible because the political capital that was going to be needed to change the opinions of the Afghan leadership to get them to devote time to this was going to be too much. And U.S. leaders have other things that they're worried about. We're not going to be able to fix this problem. It's too difficult. And I came, there's many things like corruption that I eventually came around to the same feeling that why well, you can't really fix this. Now, well, like corruption as a historian, once you know in the first place, it's incredibly difficult to fix. Um, but so, so that changed. But then as I started um, trying to understand why there were defeats, why things were happening the way they were happening, then I became more and more, you know, pessimistic over time. Um, you know, as, as a historian looking at these things. So now when I look at it, I don't want to say it was completely impossible that we couldn't have succeeded either in our goals of defeating the Taliban or probably more likely enabling the government to stand on its own. It's just that I now see it as very unlikely. So I look at the war as the better way to think about the war is, could we have managed it better? Could we have done something that was more sustainable, less costly? Um, did Were there opportunities that we missed to have done so? And I think there were a number of opportunities. A lot of them come early on, not including the Taliban and the bond process and the political process. I mean, that really sticks out and that stuck out for a long period of time, which I think we all know from studying the Treaty of Versailles and various other um, peace agreements that the defeated power should be involved in the, in, in the, the defeated party should be involved in the discussions for the new peace. But we didn't do that. Um, we didn't work hard on building an army um, early enough. And, and I'm not sure if these things would have brought peace. Um, I, and I guess at this point, I'm skeptical they would have. But I do think they would have created less cost for us, both in money and manpower. It would have made it more difficult for the Taliban. It would have made the government a little bit stronger, and that all would have been to our benefit. I see another head has popped in. Hello. Thank you so much. Uh, just want to introduce myself to the audience. I'm Erin Cox from Oxford University Press. And as Susan, my colleague, prefaced in the beginning, I will take, I will be posing some questions um, from the audience to you gentlemen. Carter, Jeff, thank you so much. This has been such a fascinating um, discussion. And, and Carter, the personal stories that you're telling, I think, are so amazing and powerful, too. And, and uh, the book, you have so many of those. And so it's, it's important, I think, um, when we're looking at this. Um, one of the questions from the audience is, how did you first, uh, Carter, how did you first get interested in this region and decide to start writing about it? So um, I ended up um, as a civilian um, uh, kind of analyst working with the Marines in Iraq. Um, and spending time in Iraq, I uh, didn't take enough time to learn Arabic. Um, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is I kind of I, I got more interested in continuing to work on these kind of problems. So when Afghanistan came around, or when, when I got done working in Iraq, I thought, well, I'd like to see Afghanistan, work in Afghanistan, see what's see what that's like. And then that kind of sucked me in and I stopped being so much of an analyst and a historian. I became more involved in the policy side of things, although I was still kind of keeping my historian head on as much as I could. Um, and then so that drew me into Afghanistan. And the other thing is having seen in um, Iraq how it's how not knowing the 
language was quite damaging to data collection and and and, and just and, well talking to people building relationships doing work for policy or doing work for as as, as a historian or someone wants to understand um that i devoted a whole lot more time to learning costumes in afghanistan and that made a that made a tremendous difference um the the, the language was just um was huge yeah definitely and that sort of leads into um the, another question from the audience, you incorporate the voices of women and girls from villages. How difficult was it to get to know Afghans? I'm sure speaking their same language helped quite a bit. Um, but, you know, how was it? How was it? Were they welcoming in some ways or no? And 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 what was that process of sort of being welcomed in, I guess? Well, it's kind of two questions there. So the first part, being welcomed was not hard at all. Afghans are gracious. One of the things about Afghanistan that draws you in is, is the people and the friendships you build, um, in, in which you can see with how much, how many Americans right now want to try to help their Afghans who are, who are Afghans who they know who are trying to get evacuated. It's because the friendships become so um, endearing, and the Afghans again are so gracious. Like when you make them a speak, speaking pashtu and you're trying to learn things, they take the time with you. They smile. They're happy that you're learning their language. Um, it's not at all like when I was learning French or German, which which I'm not any good at anymore. Um, <laughs> but where where you know missing something was was the the, the result of that would be um, harsh reprimand. Um, that's not the case uh, for for Afghanistan. Now, but for the the women, now that is a difficult relationship when it comes to the villages and it comes to like Garmsir. So um, you'll probably notice in the book that a lot of the discussions I have on women, are, the the women are more based in the cities than elsewhere. Um, and even the stuff for the, the women in the countryside, that's coming more from poetry, more from um, secondary sources, or more from conversations from women in the city who are able to describe some of that. I've never sat with an Afghan woman in her home in the countryside. Uh, and that would have been a great, a great cultural problem if I, if, if I had done that. I don't think it's right that it'd be a cultural problem, but, but it was. And we did have Americans there um, with, with the Marines and some of our civilians, like, like Gail along with USAID, who were able to talk to the women Men on a regular basis who were able to see them in their homes, sometimes see the men and the women together in their homes. Um, so that's a, you know, that's a totally different, wider experience. Um, inside a, when I was working in Kabul with General Dunford, he, was, he wanted to make sure that he had a connection to the women leaders and other um, important women inside of Kabul. And so he asked me to make sure that connection would remain and that, and that those women could have meetings with him. Um, so in that form, I was able to meet more women. And that was an eye opener too. Um, to just to understand, even under the democratic government, how oppressed women were in Afghanistan, even their strongest leaders, the strongest women leaders would still get berated by the other men in parliament or even by their own husbands for, for who they were. And if you look carefully, you'll notice that many of the strongest women in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan right now, they've either divorced their husbands or, or separated from their husbands or their husbands are dead. Um, so it really is a is a hard situation. I mean, it's going to be worse under the Taliban, but 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 I don't I, I don't want to paint the the democratic government that was in Afghanistan as white either. Um, it's an incredibly difficult situation. Definitely. Um, another question from the audience: Do you think the U.S. will deal diplomatically with the Taliban, or do you foresee our eventual reentry into Afghanistan after future terror attacks? Um. I think that I, I'm not sure how much diplomatically we'll end up dealing with the Taliban. Um, there's some reason to, uh, and, and I guess, and I don't see a great reason to go um, sanctioning them or totally cutting them off. Um, I would say more that, you know, as President Biden has said, the United States has few real interests in Afghanistan. So if we have few real interests, how much time we're we really going to spend on the Taliban anyways? Do we want to see Secretary Blinken in Afghanistan all the time, or do we want to see him in in in, in China or in Russia or in Europe or in, in Latin America, on um, South America? So, I and and then if you think about if the Biden administration is going to decide that it wants to have relations with the Taliban of any significant sort, it's going to encounter a good amount of domestic blowback for that. So that would lean me towards whatever diplomatic relations we have will probably be thin. Um, in terms of another attack on the United States, um, it's hard to say how exactly the United States will react. My hope is that we'll be resilient and just endure it. I don't think a 9-11 scale attack is very likely. And if something less than that happens, I hope we just carry on having learned from COVID and other experiences that we're strong enough to deal with it and just keep on 
just keep on moving. If we do go back into Afghanistan, in a way, it makes what's happened over the last 20 years an even worse defeat. Um, you know, we've now paid to leave. Having paid to leave, I just I, I hope we can move in other directions and not still be stuck in Afghanistan. Yeah. Another question that sort of dovetails with this is is with the Taliban being in uh, being in power, this could bubble up, you know, some wars not only in Southeast Asia, and, but also maybe skirmishes between China and Russia and the U.S. Do you foresee any any problems there or any any conflicts that are on the horizon that we we, we should be thoughtful of or worried about? I think that question you start when you start looking out ten years. Um, and, and Jeff may have his own in, in, in insight into this. When you, when you start looking out 10 years in a place like Afghanistan that's at the, that, that's the juncture between Pakistan, India, China, Russia, Iran, the possibility of friction there is, looks fairly likely. I'm not sure if that results in a war. Does it result in proxy activity in competition where different sides are trying to sabotage each other or supporting insurgencies or guerrilla movements against each other? I think that's looking 10, 20 years out, that, that's definitely a possibility. Since if the, I, I hope the United States isn't too entwined in that, though, our, ourselves, because, again, I'm not, I'm not sure what our interests are there. Our, our fundamental interest has been terrorism, so I'm not sure how much we would want to get dragged into that kind of proxy war um, in Afghanistan or any, of the re or any of the rest of the region. Yeah. Jeff, do you have some thoughts on that subject, too? Well, just just broadly speaking, um, you know, personal anecdote and then analysis. Uh, back in two thousand and four, uh, I went to Vietnam and spent a, a month or so doing historical research, which which by the way means backpacking uh, in, in, in Vietnam. And I remember my father, as I was leaving, who had served in the, in the U.S. military in the sixties, said. Vietnam is not a place that a person would want to go in his in his mental framework. You know that there's no sense in which like you would go to Vietnam to vacation, uh, and that that reminds me that it is highly likely that we'll be having that conversation with my son when he goes to Afghanistan or when he goes to to Iraq in 25 years. And the reason is, and this is the analysis part, the reason is I think we need to remember that al allies are made by common enemies, not by common interest. And we have, as, as Carter mentioned, there's a lot of other countries that have an interest or would like an interest in this part of the world whom we would not want them to have it. Uh, so uh, that's why we went in to block the Soviets you know, in, in 1980. And, uh, and that's honestly why I would not, would not be surprised by American reentry 15 years from now in some form or fashion, aiding the Afghans against someone else. I suggest your son uh, go to Afghanistan before Iraq. Nothing wrong with Iraq, but Afghanistan has um, the mountains and such are very inspiring. I can't, I can't imagine either. That's that's the amazing thing about it. I just can't get my mind around it. <laughs> um, what do you think is the most misunderstood aspect of the U.S. role in Afghanistan, Carter? Um, that's a good question. I guess I'm not sure this is the most misunderstood. Um, but the thing that I find, it's the idea that we easily could have left. Um, and we, we talked about some of this, this already. But it's really tempting these days to look back at 2001 or 2002 and say, we toppled them, we pushed out Al-Qaeda, we should have left them. And I think it, it just forgets the historical context of the time, which we've, we've now talked a, a lot about. Um, but I think it, it's, it's healthier for us to recognize how difficult it was and what challenges that there were to, 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 to getting out rather than thinking, oh, just so easy, you just should have left. Um, because in a way, it, it sets it up to, for us to think that life in the international system is easier than it is, that you can go and get involved in something and get out easy and that, and that leaders have more latitude to do things than they actually do. The Afghan war is a tragedy. Um, it's a tragedy because it was unlikely we were going to win, and it was hard to get out. Um, and, and I think trying to gloss it over with easy solutions to win or easy ways to get out, I, I think it's missing the, the bigger picture. Yeah. 
Um, let's turn to the book just for a little bit. When you were writing this book, did you think about uh, the ways in which histories of Soviet involvement in Afghanistan were written? Since you're talking about sort of the American war in Afghanistan, did you did you look at it from this sort of Soviet perspective as well? On, I mean, I was aware of the books that had been written in the past. Um, and I was aware of the Soviet experience, and I certainly thought as, as when doing policy stuff about what the Soviets were doing. In terms of the history, I, th I, I guess the number one thing I thought about the Soviet period was there isn't really, so there's some very good books written about the Soviet period, but there isn't a single history that historians like Jeff and I turn to to say, this is the book to read so you fully understand the Soviet-Afghan war that has all the details you need to understand, the political aspects, the cultural aspects, the military aspects. In Vietnam, we have those books. The Korean War, we have those books. On the Arab-Israeli conflicts, those books exist. The Soviet-Afghan War, and, and I may have missed something, and so if, if Jeff wants to correct me, I'll stand corrected, but it doesn't have that kind of book. And so that's what struck me most, is that I want to write that kind of book for our experience. Is it, why isn't a book like that written from the Soviet perspective? Is it just nobody's done it or the information isn't out there? Or we need more time to sort of digest everything. Um, so the Soviets have written books from their own, um, from their own perspective mm -hmm. and their soldiers and generals have written something. And, and I suspect there are actually Soviet general histories, but there's no book in English that covers that. No translation I know of, of the Soviet books um, to do that, the Russian books to do that. But Jeff, you look like you're- uh, No, I was gonna say the exact same thing. I, I, I think you know, to, to have any kind of useful history of that period, you'd have to speak Russian yeah. or read it more accurately. Yeah. Wow. Um, what do you, Carter, what do you hope people take away from the book? Um, one thing about the difficulty to get out, but I also hope that they'll see one other point that I made a little bit earlier, that we were there both for kind of realist reasons like counterterrorism, but there is this underflow of idealistic reasons as to why we were there. Um, I, I hope that they're able to take away that um, we did many foolish things in Afghanistan and many things that should have been different. And, and, and we shouldn't forget those and nor should we absolve people of those mistakes. But we should also see how much good was trying to be done. Um, sometimes that was at high levels, often that was at lower levels by, by soldiers or, or humanitarian workers or, or civilians there. Um, you know, to, to understand that Americans, for, uh, to a great extent, were trying to do good there, but it, it, it didn't work out. Now, I don't mean to, I don't want, again, I don't use the word again, I don't want to whitewash things that have happened. There's a great many other mistakes that have happened that the book will lay out at the high level, like 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 like, like serving some of the campaigns we entered into, at the lower level with, with house searches and, and accidentally killing civilians, but accidentally maybe didn't have to be so accidental all the time. Maybe we could have been more controlled. Um, so there's a lot of other mistakes we, we made too. So, I mean, like I wrote in the book, I kind of see the, the whole experience as a dark cloud with some glimmers of light. Um, so I, I hope people take that away from it. I hope people also take away the Afghans and what their, what their different experiences are. I mean, as someone who has been perhaps too close to the Afghans, I just hope, I mean, I guess maybe I'll, I hope this is, so, um, you know, you always hope that you remember your dog, not in your dog's last days, but in your dog when your dog was running with you and doing things with you. I hope that people remember the Afghans and the Afghan democracy and the Afghans we worked with, not for the last month, but remember all the other things and the sacrifices that were experienced. So. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, now that so much has happened since the book was published in July, do you see yourself writing a second book uh, sort of encompassing this or just, you know, adding a few extra chapters uh, into this book for next the next edition or, um, and, or does time need to pass in order to sort of process it all? Um, so a lot of that will depend on OUP and you guys. Um, <laughs> it will depend on when you want a paperback out. It will depend on when you want a second edition out. Um, I mean, as a historian, I think Jeff, Jeff would probably agree with me that, you know, a little time, you know, five years or so would be best. That gives you the best, give you the best perspective. I'm not sure you guys will give me that kind of time. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it sounds, sounds like a sales issue to me. <laughs> your, your, your editor is watching, I think, so he'll, he can chime in in the chat. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. And what it, what has been the response from some people that you worked with in Afghanistan or have you have you had any response to the book from from anyone that you met with or um, worked with? I mean, uh, so everyone everyone's pretty positive from the Afghans. I know I don't think any of them have had time to read the book or, yeah. or, or anything like that. Um, from the Americans I work with, most of my friends, so they're, they're positive about it. But I mean, the, the people are certainly going to have differences with it. Um, I mean, I think there'll be differences over that I'm fairly critical of a variety of military decisions, and I think people will um, take odds to that. People will probably, um, there'll probably be some criticism that I've, uh, I say that it was very difficult to succeed. And someone could say that, well, he, um, you know, in the past, he was more positive about change, and now he's more negative. I mean, that, that would be a reasonable criticism um, to make. Um, so I think some of that will come out um, over over time, um, and but it, it's, that's okay. It's how things are. That's right. May I, may I ask a final question, if I may? Uh, Please. And, and Carter, I would just I would just love honestly, I'd love your reaction to uh, something I had been saying uh, in the last couple of weeks as the end of the American experience thus far. Uh, in Afghanistan has dovetailed with 9-11, uh, the commemoration coming up, coming up 9-11. Um, and I, I raise this as a person who's never done policy making. I've only done from the ivory tower. Uh, and I, it strikes me that an interesting way to look at this as a matter of strategy for the United States is to see how much the entire operation cost, which was a billion dollars, uh, I'm sorry, a trillion dollars, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Uh, a trillion dollars. Um, and to say at any point, if you had handed the American people a trillion dollars, would you have said, you know, I think we should put it in Afghanistan. I mean, you could put it anywhere. This is where we want to put it. You know, is that the best use of our money? And is this the best use of our money for security alone? Uh, and I realize it's an unfair question because policymakers never had that opportunity. They were there, especially the Obama and subsequent administrations, they were there, they didn't get a chance to get in. But I'm just curious what your reaction is to, to that sentiment. Um, well, the first thing I think is Obama kind of saw that. You know, when he was told that it was going to be $100 billion per year to have U.S. forces at a level of around 100000 in Afghanistan, he said, there's no way I'm doing that. I'm not spending a trillion dollars over the next 10 years in Afghanistan. I have to take care of the economy. We have to repay the the stimulus that had just put in been put in for the Great Recession, on and he recognized that as something not to do, and so what that led him. I mean, Obama did dramatically change our strategy. He pressed us down to a much lower force level. Up from I mean, he, he, when he came in, it was a uh, forty forty five thousand surges to a hundred thousand. He takes us down to around ten thousand, and that ten thousand give or give give or take a little bit is basically what we've had since 2015, 2014. Um, and so he created a whole different kind of strategy. So in a way, he recognized what you're saying. I guess the other answer I'd say to what you're saying is it is the, it is the difference of they're making decisions by year, not not in bulk. And so they're making decisions in they're not if they if they get out of Afghanistan, they're not getting a trillion dollars. Um, you know they'll they'll get the amount they save that year. And as the number goes down from a hundred billion to something more like thirty billion. And then you're weighing the risks of, is there going to be a terrorist attack? Isn't there going to be a terrorist attack? Then staying in longer um, becomes more, uh, more palatable. I mean, if you want to know, again, if you want to know what they, what are they worried about? They're worried about what happened last month. That's what they don't want to see happen. And that, and definitely don't want to spend a trillion dollars to avoid that. Um, but if you're talking about something smaller that looks much more sustainable than and yeah. Yeah. That's a good answer. Well, and a, and a good and a good place to to end, I think, um, as our as our time has elapsed. And uh, but thank you both, uh, Carter, Jeff. This was an incredible conversation, really interesting. Um, and for anybody who wants more information about Carter's book, The American War in Afghanistan, you can visit that link. And uh, gentlemen, thank you again. Thank I'll you. Give you a thank virtual you. Thank you. virtual clap. Thank you. And thank you, Carter, for a great book. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.